Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Feddy Night Festivus, brought to you by the Federalist Society's Student Division and the Georgetown Law FedSoc Chapter. My name is Molly Hogan. I'm the co-president of the Federalist Society Chapter at Georgetown Law. For those of you who haven't joined a Feddy Fight Night before, here's how it will go. Our distinguished guest, Professor Richard Epstein, will spend the first portion of our evening together airing his legal grievances. Once he's finished, we'll open up the floor to questions. You must be logged on as a participant of the Zoom webinar to ask a question. You can use the raise hand function if you're on your computer or star nine on your phone. When we get to your question, I'll call on you by name and our host will unmute your microphone so you can ask your question. Please restate your name and affiliation before asking your question. And at some point tonight, please do subscribe to the Federalist Society's YouTube page. They're nearing 50,000 subscribers and would love to hit that goal by the new year. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest who really needs no introduction, Professor Richard Epstein. He is the Lawrence A. Tisch Professor of Law and the Director of the Classical Liberal Institute at NYU Law, as well as the James Parker Hall Distinguished Service Professor of Law Emeritus at the University of Chicago. Professor Epstein has also served as a senior fellow at the Hoover Institute since 2000. He received a BA summa cum laude from Columbia University, a BA in law with first class honors from Oxford University, and an LLB degree cum laude from the Yale Law School. Now, the tradition of Federalist Festivus begins with the airing of the legal grievances, followed by feats of jurisprudential strength via Q&A. And until someone pins Professor Epstein, Festivus is not over, or more realistically, when 90 minutes conclude. And with that, the floor is yours, Professor Epstein. Well, thank you so much for that generous institution. Uh, when this began, I thought that what I would talk about was major grievances, then I discovered that Molly was managed to one of my prize Roman law students. So I think I will mention as my first grievance, the insufficient attention to Roman law and classical principles as part of the American legal education system. This is not just a frivolous kind of point. Generally speaking, if you're talking about constitutional law in similar fields, my view is a top-down approach is almost always wrong and a bottoms up approach is almost always right. Top-down approach is somebody who looks at this thing and they look at it through the lens of public law without understanding that institutions of freedom, speech, property, and the like all have private law origins. And the only way in which you can understand the public law interactions between these fields is to first understand how ordinary, simpler private transactions work. Uh, this point of difference turns out to have a deep set of influences on the way in which one wants to conceptualize the entire issue. For a very long time in my legal career, I realized that it's important not to worry only about marginal cases, but to also worry about what is the central feature in virtually all of these situations, namely the case in which you're trying to figure out major fault lines in the legal system as to how various topics ought to be organized. And the axis around which that takes place today is more salient than ever before. It's the choice, I think, between a classical liberal position on the one hand and a progressive legal position on the other hand. Classical uh, legal positions essentially start with the following presumption, uh, that government intervention is shown to be, is to be assumed to be an evil until it has been shown to be a good. And then since it's not an anarchist position, what it does is tries to identify the various areas in which that presumption that things will work pretty well are going to be established. And the first of these kinds of protections, which is very relevant today in an age of COVID, is the way in which you start to deal with uh, matters of force and fraud. And that also includes, broadly speaking, all sorts of issues having to do with epidemics, plagues, disease, and so forth, which can be spread either by natural causes on the one hand or by human causes on the other, or some combination of the two. It also says that there's generally a presumption against monopoly, which can be fixed either by rate regulation carefully executed or by an antitrust law similarly done in a prudent kind of fashion. If somebody comes out to be a progressive with respect to the ways in which these issues are done, it turns out they take a very different view. They're much less worried about the potential abuses of government power, self-interest, collusion, and the like. 
uh, monopoly institutions of one sort or another. And what they do is they seem to think that if you regard the government as a general force for good in life, uh, that there ought to be no effective limitations on the way in which it starts to operate. Uh, so if it turns out to be the question of administrative law, you give large deference to administrative agencies and you have virtually no restrictions on the way in which power can be organized or shall we say delegated to inferior systems inside the system. It also turns out if you believe in this situation, uh, you don't think that strong property rights or economic liberties are an essential feature of the system. There's something that people have on sufferance which can be overridden by a minimum wage law on the one hand or a zoning ordinance on the other hand. If you're a classical liberal, you do not give yourself that degree of luxury uh, since the presumption is that every exercise of government power has to justify itself. Uh, what you then start to do is, is to look very critically to figure out whether or not the particular actions which are taken in any given case can be justified by some larger social good that it serves. And I stress that last phase, larger social good, because sometimes it's thought that a classical liberal position embraces some sort of an unvarnished kind of individual egotism so that every person's allowed to do whatever he wants whenever he or she wants to do it. And that's the kind of thing which I don't believe in. Essentially what you're trying to do in these systems is to create an arrangement where when individuals act in their own self-interest, the way this will play out socially is that there'll be social improvements that will happen when people structured in this particular way behave. And generally speaking, the uh, importance of competitive markets lies in the fact that as Adam Smith said a very long time ago, uh, that if individuals pursue their self-interest in a competitive market, it will align overall with respect to social welfare. That is not true with every kind of action. And so what happens is you privilege competition and you worry about forced coercion and everything else. And now when it also comes to this, it's not just a question of freedom and competition with respect to the way in which you deal with material substantive, uh, it's also a particular situation in which you have to worry about the way in which you think about um, how the market of ideas work. There's a famous expression by Oliver Wendell Holmes, which says that the best test of truth is its ability to get itself accepted in the marketplace. And the word test means that everything is provisional. It's not absolute. And so competition with respect to these markets, I think, is absolutely critical. And so my first grievance is the uh, very dangerous turn, I think, in American life, uh, where there is a definition of certain people who count as experts. And these experts are entitled to have exclusive say over the most pressing issues of public policy that we face today. Uh, it was not the Trump administration that tried to enforce any of these restrictions on open speech. It turned out to be the ubiquitous social media uh, for example, YouTube takes it upon itself to say that anybody who uh, wants to speak about public health issues has to be in line with what the World Health Organization says, or otherwise they will pull the post down and leave the field to somebody else. This is not just a real minor threat, it's a major threat. Uh, one of the areas in which it becomes perfectly apparent that we have to worry about this problem is the way in which we start to deal with the situation associated with respect to to COVID. And, and here there are of course two major issues and I'll mention them both and leave you to decide yourself which way you want to think about them. Uh, one is the question about how it is that we have a general global strategy with respect to containment. Uh, the classical liberal position essentially is what you do is you try to figure out the most vulnerable portions of the population are very chary with respect to injunctive relief of one kind or another and try to create some effective form of isolation tests or whatever it is, so that people in these situations will be able to escape attack, whereas the people who are going to be subject to the attack are those who are generally going to be able, quite ably, uh, to withstand the uh, illness. And in support of that position is the proposition that the median age of people who die from COVID tends to be at 80 or so, and that most of the people who die have serious comorbidities, which otherwise would have shortened their lives. And so when you have a much more comprehensive kind of restriction, it's going to play devastation and havoc with respect to sort of economic activities. In New York in April, when this thing first took place, they shut down all forms of medical operations. They shut down restaurants. They shut down schools. They shut down lots of things. And it's not at all clear that at that particular element, what you did was had a kind of gain that remotely dealt uh, with the costs that were at hand. And it seems to me that one of the reasons you want to have a more open discussion is people have to be very candid about the ways in which these things work. 
I have not seen myself any evidence which would displace the classical liberal presumption that in dealing with these things, injunctions and quarantines should be used with a light hand. I could well be wrong, but I think when you see lots of eminent epidemiologists and physicians of one kind or another taking that sort of position, one ought to be very cautious before you shut off that discourse and make it impossible for people who disagree with the regnant solution to express their peace. And the second issue is one that I think is pretty close to my heart. Uh, the question is, well, what sort of medication do we use to treat the COVID condition when it arises? I think all credit went to Donald Trump and everybody in that administration who actively pushed the development of vaccines, which are now beginning to hit the market. I think they did it in exactly the right way. They did not give, as progressives might want to do, a general subvention for people to go out and to invest in these things. What they did is they gave guaranteed contracts to purchase such that if somebody made a successful vaccine, uh, then it, the government would purchase it. And so the incentives on the companies were to take a risk, which they effectively managed, because we now see at least two vaccines and perhaps more that are coming onto the market. Uh, there are always dangers with respect to vaccines that people ought to be informed about, but the general enthusiasm that one sees upon people lining up in order to get it suggests that at least for the moment, this is a positive situation in which we ought to encourage the development use uh, of these vaccines until some evidence to the contrary comes to the place. Uh, but there's another side to this story, which is what sort of treatments do we give in a world in which we have no vaccine? And the basic situation that we have today, I think is quite alarming. Uh, the only kinds of medical treatments that we have are those which take place in hospital, where by the time you get there, the mortality rates are very high. In some groups, 10%, in other groups, perhaps as high as 20 there's one drug called remdesivir, uh, which is thought to work in those areas. It's extremely expensive to use, has to be applied intravenously, and it has only uncertain effects because it's not been checked. A rival drug is one called hydroxychloroquine, which is not administered alone, but in a combination package with zinc on the one hand, azithromycin on the other. And it turns out that in the United States, if you look at the CDC, uh, and you listen to the words of Anthony Fauci, who's our chief medical advisor, uh, they all counterindicate this thing saying it ought not to be used. If on the other hand, you start looking at private physicians and so forth, and look at the practice that takes place around the world, of course, hydroxychloroquine, HCQ, is a perfectly common substance that is used with great effect in companies like Nigeria, India, Bangladesh, and so forth, all of whom have death rates which are far lower than those in the United States. Uh, what happens is if you engage in this sort of big time administrative state, the sort that Mr. Fauci chances, uh, I think incorrectly, what you believe is that the only standard for dealing with drugs is a double blind clinical trial. That might work for drugs trying to deal with cholesterol. It does not work, I dare say, when you're trying to figure out how you treat diseases. The studies are hard to do. You have to get people within the first five days that they have the illness. You have to administer the entire package and so forth. And if you don't do those particular conditions, everything will start to fail. And yet what happens is we simply do not let this stuff come onto the market uh, because those people who want to make strong statements in favor of their use, which might influence the public, are shushed and hushed and laughed off of the stage. Uh, this, I think, is very, very dangerous. You need to have a full and open debate. Generally speaking, having spent a lot of time teaching the FDA, uh, there's a huge advantage for old drugs that have had multiple previous uses because one of the things you know is that very unlikely to have side effects because you have millions upon millions of dosages given in this case for over 65 years in a drug which is perfectly appropriate even for pregnant women, which turn out to be one of the most sensitive groups that you're having. And so the safety issue is not particularly important. The worst that can happen on effectiveness is it doesn't work. The best is that it could save your life. It's a trade worth taking as far as I can tell, and yet you do not see it done in the United States, and it's because of this monopoly of thought that we have. And my view about this is when anybody describes somebody as impeccable, somebody as a czar, somebody who knows just about everything on these particular subjects, that's where you really have to be very, very worried. Free competition in the market for ideas is absolutely essential, and it seems to me that with a drug that's in common use, decentralized decisions by individuals and their physicians as to whether to take or not to take a particular drug are much preferable to having a government czar of one form or another decreeing what is and what is not appropriate medical kinds of behaviors.
Many independent decisions are subject to correction. A single dominant position by the government will take a blowtorch to get it out of a position. And we have to get ourselves out of that particular mind, uh, the progressive mindset where monopoly government orders turn out to be uh, the better type of thing. Now, this kind of attitude that we have uh, creating crises uh, or dealing with products in an improper way, I think gets to this next area, which I have deep concern going forward. And that's the interaction that we have between the problems of energy on the one hand and environmental protection on the other hand. Uh, this is obviously a very, very vexing subject. Uh, but again, it seems to me that the first thing one wants to do is to make sure that all the voices that speak to a particular issue are going to be heard and to have their chance. If you listen to the current debates on global warming, it seems to be taken as an article of faith uh, that carbon dioxide generated by human beings is the source of a dangerous level of global warming today, which requires major programs, even as extreme as the uh, Green New Deal, limitations on the use of fossil fuels in one form or another, other kinds of restrictions on lifestyle in order to deal with an imminent peril. There are, of course, many other physicians, not physicians, scientists and other experts and economists and so forth, who don't think that the evidence points in that particular direction and would say, if you start to go in one extreme way on the Green New Deal, you're going to create other difficulties, uh, which are extremely important to worry about. Uh, no technology, whether it's solar energy or wind, is going to be harmless in the way in which it works. To evaluate these technologies, you have to look at them from birth unto death. You have to figure out how you fabricate the various kinds of panels for solar things or the various kinds of windmill blades, all of which take intensive use of fossil fuels and heavy doses of major metals to put into place. They're not easy to operate. They have to be disposed of when they're done. And the truth about the matter is they suffer from two fatal flaws uh, that I think are insufficiently addressed. Uh, one of those is that it turns out that you cannot store solar energy um, when the sun doesn't shine and you cannot soar in wind energy or when the air turns out to be relatively quiet. And so what happens is you tend to get peaks and valleys in the energies of these sort so that you get the most amount of solar energy when you don't need it. And the same thing is true with respect to wind energy because you can't modulate the way you can with a storable commodity such as fossil fuels. So my own particular views on this is uh, that what wants to do is to improve the way in which we extract and use these fossil fuels, given their huge advantages, rather than committing ourselves to a situation in which we're going to turn ourselves heavily over uh, to alternative unproven and inefficient energy supply. This is not an argument to say that I'm going to ban them. As a classical liberal, I don't wish to ban any technology uh, so long as it meets the usual requirements dealing with public nuisances and the like. Uh, but I think if the solar energy or the wind energy is as good as been claimed, we should expect it to be sold in a voluntary market. We should accept individuals to set up with private venture capital funding in order to make these things work. We do not want to have cylinder-like projects where the government gives subsidies to things which turn out not to work. One of the things that the classical liberal says is that people who are investing their own money are likely to be much more careful in the way it is spent uh, than people who spend other people's money who would like to be much more lackadaisical and careless with respect to the ways in which these things go. So then the question is, how do you start looking at the evidence? And I'm a lawyer, uh, but I've dealt with public nuisance kinds of questions for a very long time in my life. And one of the things that you discover sadly is that in order to be a lawyer, you also have to know something about the science of any particular field which is subject to your regulation. And so a good trial lawyers essentially become extremely knowledgeable in the kinds of work they do. And hopefully academics will do exactly the same kind of thing. And so what do you want to do? Well, the first thing you want to do is to take a very simple theoretical observation. You look at many kinds of key environmental phenomena and what do you discover? Uh, they turn out to be cyclical. They go up and they go down. If you looked at Lake Michigan, the lake rises, then it goes down and then it goes up again. Uh, if you start looking at hurricanes, they tend to go in cycles. Whether you measure it by number of hurricanes or by their intensity, it's always a, some kind of a sine wave that you're going to see. If you look at the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, what happens is it turns out it's going up monotonically. It is extremely difficult to explain a cyclical phenomenon by simply looking at a monotonic function. Uh, the standard techniques don't work. You can't magnify or reduce the size of the sine wave to make it go because you're still going to have variability. 
You can't decide, well, you have to wait three years before something's going to happen, because even if you push the thing forward, you're still going to have the cycle. So what you have to think about is that there must be other sometimes unidentified kinds of situations that are out there which could explain what's going on. It might be sunspots, it might be volcanoes, it might be the natural turnover of water. I can't give you an answer of what it's going to be, but I can say unless you start to look for those sorts of things, you're always going to have yourself some kind of a difficult problem. And then the second half of the difficulties that one sees with these programs are what are the adverse effects that we're supposed to be identifying wholly apart from a temperature change. And if you go back and you look at the inconvenient truth of 2006, everything that Al Gore said at that particular time did not pan out. So that by 2016, when we were supposed to be in chaos, things were pretty good. Uh, between 2016 and 2018, uh, global temperatures went down by uh, one degree, I believe it was centigrade, uh, a huge amount that takes place. Uh, you have to be able to explain it. It goes back up again, but again, the variability, even in a short-term period, says you can't basically treat it to carbon dioxide. You have to worry about water vapor, which is a much more powerful, but much more erratic kind of greenhouse gas. It's much more common, uh, 25 times as common as, say, carbon dioxide, and it's three to four times more powerful. And then if you actually start looking at the conditions on the ground, uh, what you typically understand is that carbon dioxide is not just a greenhouse gas, it's also one of the two agents, along with water, uh, to go for photosynthesis. And as you start to increase the levels, plant growth starts to increase, which has happened in the world. 15, 13, or 14 percent of the Earth's surface is greener now than it was 30 years ago. That's a huge increase in what's going on. You also discover that temperature variability starts to go down, so that if you look for really peak hot days in the United States, look to the 1930s when carbon dioxide levels were low, rather than today uh, when it turns out that they're much higher. So what does this say? It says you have to be extremely cautious before you start to draw these kinds of conclusions. And simply saying that uh, we believe X percentage of scientists believe in this, that, or the other thing is not the same thing as having a rational debate with respect to what has gone on. And I'm particularly worried about the way in which this thing has operated under the Biden administration, uh, because virtually every one of his major appointments in energy and environment is somebody who takes, I think, an alarmist kind of view with respect to these issues. And so what they want to do is to have huge cross subsidies for wind and solar, which I think will distort the system. They want to prevent fracking of uh, oil and gas on uh, federal lands, which will completely upset the uh, political economy of the United States, make energy more expensive, uh, create a greater dependence on foreign oil, uh, reduce the influence that the United States can have with its strong energy policies overseas. I think there are many, many negatives. And I'm very sorry to say that I think what has happened is that trade-offs, which are what you always want to think about when you believe that there's always uncertainty with respect to action, are not thought to be a serious issue at this particular point. People start to act as though the science is settled, uh, the remedies are perfectly clear, and I think it's likely to move us very much into the wrong kind of a direction. And so on those issues, I think I have a serious grievance because I think the kinds of results that we're likely to see are going to be much more destructive than the results that we would like to have. Now, let me just talk about two other areas which are uh, not having to do with the environment, not having to do with public health, but having to do with the organization of ordinary markets um, in labor and services and so forth. As a good classical liberal, one of the things that you discover is that if you're dealing with ordinary labor markets, competitive circumstances seem to apply, many buyers, many sellers, uh, so that allowing the interplay of buyers and sellers to determine wages and prices ought to work with a great deal of efficiency. That's one of the things that tended to be encouraged um, in the recent administration of Donald Trump. It may have been by inattention, it may have been by design, uh, but what you saw was a very strong improvement with respect to the way in which these labor markets operated, which had distributional effects that were unexpected by progressives, but which should be welcomed by them. Noticeably, what happened is as you started to see a huge amount of increases in wages for people at the bottom end of the totem pole, uh, minorities, um, people with lower education, elderly who had retired, uh, and they get a large part of the amount of the social gain that's created. And it's clear why that happened. Every time you remove a labor restriction and say it's a fixed amount, it's a larger fraction of the salary of low-income workers. So the imposition of the tax or the regulation will have a devastating effect upon these groups, 
the release will do exactly the opposite thing and will start to free them up. Employers will now start to hire them because there's going to be rest by way of a load. If you could make it clear that these things are relatively permanent, they will start investing in higher amounts in human capital in order to trade these people. And you'll see something of a boom in the labor market, uh, which has not been seen for a very long time. Uh, one of the great dangers of a progressive theory is they tend to have this doomsday attitude with respect to labor markets. The huge size of management relative to labor means that unless the government intervenes, poor people are going to be forever constrained to the never level of health. We're going to start to see greater levels of income inequality, greater levels of social unrest. None of that started to pan out. And yet if you start to push back into the opposite direction, I have every reason to believe that the consequences that nobody welcomes will become much more likely to happen. So one of the early signs of this was AB5, Assembly Bill 5 in California, which decided that what it was going to do was to improve the so-called gig economy. Now, a gig economy means exactly what it says, is that people don't have long-term fixed jobs. What they do is they go from one short-term employment fix to another short-term employment fix. Many times they're independent contracts. There's very rarely are they permanent kinds of employees. Now, it turns out that the word employee, as opposed to the word independent contractor, is something of a lightning rod. Uh, there are no ways that you could have labor unions organize independent contractors. They can organize employees. You cannot apply a minimum wage law to an independent contractor. You can apply it to a particular employee. So there has been a concerted effort to take these people who essentially are moving much more fluidly into markets and to reclassify them as employees uh, so that now they are subject to various kinds of taxes, workman's compensation obligations, potential unionization and the like, which create the kinds of rigidities that mean that these markets will not flourish. Uh, that happened not only with drivers like uh, uh, Uber and Lyft, it also happened with journalists and with translators and with Santa Clauses and thousands of other people who in the gig economy seem to be doing pretty well for themselves. And why was this done? mainly to try to create a larger target uh, for unions to organize under a set of circumstances where unions do not make any sense. If you have workers all have different times, aspirations, and desires, you cannot, even if you want to, have effective unionization as you might have been able to have uh, with assembly line workers in the 1930s and 40s when the National Labor Act was put into play. Nonetheless, we have these kinds of situations in there. But what we understand very clearly is that the hour is no longer an effective unit of account for these kinds of work. It's the gig, it's the job, it's the ride that you start to give. And so when you start to apply something like the National Labor Relations Act on collective bargaining, or you start to apply on this particular situation, other kinds of things like the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, what well, you discover that there's a complete misfit. Uh, hours are not the appropriate situation. Bargaining units don't make any particular sense. And my great fear is that the Biden administration, which has been unfailingly, I will prove itself to be unfailingly pro-union, will try to turn the clock back 70, 80 years to introduce a kind of industrial organization that has long been rendered obsolete by technology. One of the things that we have to do in the law is to always make sure that as technical advances change the nature of various kinds of efficient firm organization there is no legal element that manages to intrude upon the situation so as to make it possible, uh, impossible for people to adjust. And so one of the things that I've defended for a very term time in my life has been essentially the rule which says a contract at will is a dominant form of employment. A person can quit or not quit for good reason, bad reason, or no reason at all. An employer can fire you for good reason, bad reason, or no reason at all. This is not meant to be an invitation to fire people like the queen of spades over their heads, they don't like it. It's just to recognize that uh, the only thing that keeps relationships together is mutual trust. And to the extent that people have that, they will be able to negotiate very long-term arrangements on an at-will basis. The moment you introduce a union, it then becomes a bilateral monopoly. You have to satisfy everybody to satisfy anybody. And the consequence often could be lockouts, disruptions and strikes and other kinds of things that we don't need. Uh, the entire labor movement in the United States was in my judgment through the National Labor Relations Act a mistake. Uh, these mistakes become more costly as we start to move forward. Now, the last topic that I'm gonna talk about very briefly is yet another very hot button topic, uh, which is the term diversity. 
Now, at one level, how can anyone be against diversity? If you're a financial analyst and somebody asks you what kind of a portfolio ought you to have, the answer will always be you want to have a diversified portfolio. And the explanation for that is pretty clear. If you put all your money in stocks, it turns out that you're uh, likely to be fluctuated, hurt badly if things go down. And generally speaking, people are a little bit risk averse. If you put all your money in one stock, it's even worse than putting it into the stock market. So that what you see now is a dominant strategy of people engaging in various forms of what they call asset allocation. So much in stocks, so much in bonds, so much in cash, so much in real estate, so much domestic, so much foreign and so forth. And by working through intelligent intermediaries uh, like various kinds of mutual funds and so forth, you can achieve a high level of diversity with a very low level of risk. Well, when you start talking about labor markets, it's a little bit more difficult to diversify. I'm not very good as a bricklayer. I'm not very good as a musician. I'm a law professor, a pretty broad range within that field, uh, but it's quite clear I'm very concentrated in human capital. And so what you have to do is to essentially invest in yourself and then the market is going to work best if it turns out that there's all sorts of diverse opportunities because there are multiple employers on the other side who are willing to bid up against you. Now, in this particular market, we have to be very careful to avoid any repetition of the evils of segregation. Uh, segregation was a form of socialist apartheid in which you differentiated on grounds of race and reserved some people for some occupation and some for others. Uh, unpardonable, and I think we did a pretty good job with the Civil Rights Act in getting rid of that. Uh, but the danger is when you go one step further and you mandate diversity, you're not the mandating diversity of competition, different kinds of jobs and so forth. What you tend to do today is you tend to be trampling various kinds of quotas, various kinds of impositions that are going to put on workers of one form or another. And it's quite clear that the Biden administration is likely to support that, just as many states have done it and many corporations have done it. When corporations do it individually, my view is that they're entitled to succeed or fail as they want. Uh, my only concern under these circumstances tends to be as follows. Are they doing this particular diversity number because they fear litigation uh, under the Civil Rights Act, or are they doing it because they believe it's the best way to organize their business? There is no question that some firms will do much better if you have a very diverse population. I can still recall meeting with somebody who was a representative of a major finance company who started to talk about diversity. He said, look, uh, you want to work for us? We put together teams at 24 hours notice and they're from all over the world. The only thing they have in common maybe is that they speak English. And if you can't work with anybody, you're no, anybody and everybody, you're no use to us because then you're going to start to say, I can't do this job and I won't do that job and so forth. And so you've got to be very careful. But on the other hand, if you have a small firm, say a grocery firm or a bodega, many of these firms are reinforced by church-like activities, they're family businesses, and diversity is not a winning strategy for them. There has to be a high level of personal trust. They're not going to be engaged in World War kinds of three operations, extensive stuff. They're going to try to figure out how they cover the store 24-7. And so what you have to understand in labor markets is this kind of diversity is something I think of which we really ought to prize. And so when you start to think about diversity in labor markets, you don't want to think about a monolithic situation where every reform has a certain percentage of women, certain percentage of this minority group, that majority group, and so forth. You want to figure out a situation in which these firms can have sufficient freedom of choice to put the pieces together in whatever way they want. And in general, if you do this, you will not find every firm uh, I, living with and embracing the idea of the Civil Rights Act of being colorblind or sex blind with respect to their hiring. There will be some firms that will quite sensibly do that, um, but they'll do it in all sorts of different directions. The key point is not to make sure that any given firm meets some predetermined sense as to how things want to operate. The major thing that you want to do under these circumstances is exactly the opposite. You want to create as many different kinds of forms, let them compete one against another and see which of them succeed and which of them not. And so essentially the diversity issue starts to come back to the labor issue. When you're dealing with human capital, where people have to make very heavy investments in particular kinds of jobs, they're gonna be much more protected in a market where there are lots of people on the other side than they are gonna be in a market where there's either a government dictate uh, through the situation that we have under the union type situation or with respect to the way in which the civil rights work.
Now, if I had more time, I would start to talk about other issues. I'll just mention some of them I think that you really want to start thinking about, keeping to the civil side. Um, I'm very worried about the rise of huge numbers of antitrust actions. I think it's an extremely difficult question to figure out the extent to which various uh, uh, gatekeepers, I've already mentioned this in connection with COVID, should be allowed to exclude people. Um, regulation, free speech, antitrust is a problem. I'm generally a defender of standard kinds of um, patent protection with respect to goods against, and to, of course, allowing for generic competition. I fear that the policies in these areas may be turning astray and so forth. I'm happy to answer questions about any of these things. I do have very strong opinions uh, but the most important opinion to have is that no matter how confident you are of your position on a given individual, what you have to do is to make sure that you can change your mind when you're wrong. And people ask me, well, how do you think about your academic work? And I'll just sort of give a one minute summary of my personal history. Um, I started off always a kind of an anti-government type guy, went to England and studied 19th century case law, which was largely laissez-faire. And I come back and slowly what happens is I find that instead of being a, a sort of a natural rights guy only, I've become much more of a utilitarian consequentialist in areas. Uh, I've changed my intellectual orientation. I've certainly changed my attitude with respect to some issues. I've now been at this uh, from the time I started law school in 1964, over 56 years. I still hope that I'm capable of some sort of change, but I think the odds of that happening are going to be less, but we'll find out for sure. Now, Molly, when you take this and open it up for questions. Absolutely. Professor, thank you for getting us started by laying out some of your grievances. And now as Festivus rolls on, we come to the feats of strength portion of the evening. And until someone hints Professor Epstein, Festivus is not over. So let's rumble. As a reminder, you can get into the queue to ask a question by using the raise hand function if you're on your computer or star nine if you're on your phone. I'll call on you by name and our host will unmute you. And just remember to note your name and affiliation before asking your question. So go ahead and get those hands up. And it looks like we have our first question from Sean Callahan. Hello, Sean. Hi, Hi Professor, hello. Uh, now, do we know each other or not? Uh, well, I feel like we do after, after listening to you, but no, I don't think we do. Okay, well, good, good to meet you, Sean. Good to meet you. Uh, what would you say to uh, wavering classical liberals who are wavering because they're anxious at watching the society's coercive power migrating from democratically accountable institutions, uh, primarily you know, Congress and, and, and the, the, the presidency, uh, into less democratically accountable institutions um, and so administrative agencies and even institutions that aren't democratic at all, like private, like large private uh, companies who have uh, coercive power, uh, mostly due to technology that, had, that, that really hasn't, hadn't existed, network technology that hadn't existed before. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on Michael Lynn's uh, suggestion that, that the solution to that migration is really to expand the administrative state, but make it somehow more responsive uh, to uh, the, the people. Well, I don't think I'm gonna be pinned on that one, particularly the last suggestion, but let's go back to the beginning. Uh, the first thing you say is we're gonna move from uh, democratic institutions to a sort of privately owned capital situation. I would want to start the analysis one step further. The first question you have to ask yourself in all of these cases, is which particular actions of an individual ought to be subject to a determination by majority rule. And in many particular cases, the sort of individual claim against the state is extremely important. We recognize that today very commonly when we start to deal with issues of freedom of speech. And a common view with respect to that is that mankind minus one cannot stop the dissenter from saying those things that he or she thinks to be true about a given kind of public issue that is on access to the situation, we don't have majority rule. My view with respect to labor contracts is that it should be pretty much the same thing. And so if somebody wants to offer work to me at a wage that is below a minimum wage, I don't think the state has any explanation or justification as to why they should make me turn that down. And one of the reasons why you might want to do that is you take into account very seriously the non-pecuniary benefits of a job. 
And so well-to-do children always end up taking Payless summer internships because they get contacts, they get recommendations, they get future job offices. And I think in effect, exactly the same privilege should go to those people who have uh, lower incomes and less political influence. And so I think that the first problem we have is we get too much of Congress in there and, and I want to basically hive things off. But that's not gonna answer your question in its entirety. Uh, because what you're trying to do is to talk about lumpy institution. Um, the question here is what happens when you have state power or you have uh, what is commonly called the common carrier problem. The common carrier problem is that essentially you find yourself with only one supplier of a given kind of good. And the question is, what do you do? This issue was first raised as far back as the uh, late 17th century with Sir Matthew Hale. And he talked about this saying that in ordinary competitive markets, we allow people to determine whatever price they want in the manner that I just talked about, take it or leave it. And you either take it or you leave it. But if you have a single supplier, uh, the rule has always been that they have to take service on fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory terms. The monopoly power is thought to be too powerful in the hands of a given private supplier. And it's also too powerful when it hands in the government. And I don't think there's a huge amount of difference between the two of them, except that the government can do enforcement on its own, whereas the private monopolist or common carrier cannot. Well, when it comes to economic issues, um, it turns out, Sean, that we do have a kind of a system of rate regulation. Non-discrimination is to make sure that the monopolist can't favor his friends and hurt everybody else. But on the other hand, you have to be allowed to discriminate in the charges that you give if the cost of service to the two different components turns out to be so relatively different, you have to take that into account. The difficulty that you get with respect to the modern age is that price and money is no longer the issue. Uh, you get all your Google accounts and advertisements, your Twitter, your Facebook stuff, all that stuff is quote unquote for free. And the way in which you pay it is you allow people to share the information that you provide uh, to advertise into other persons. And what happens is that information can be used for good purposes or for bad purposes. People constantly try to put together private pol privacy policies. And I think for most part, individuals can protect themselves against those kinds of activities uh, by either signing up or not signing up. Uh, the greater difficulty comes, as I mentioned earlier, when somebody wants to shut you down uh, because they think your views are untoward. And here, the reason why I'm so diffident is I don't know whether I'm going from the frying pan into the fire or actually improving the situation. Create a situation where it turns out that uh, you say that the government can override people who censor you. Well, suppose the government decides not to override them or to basically punish other individuals whom the private carrier is willing to let go through. Uh, there are two kinds of errors under these circumstances. And for the life of me, I cannot get to the bottom of the issue to say whether I'm happier with government behavior than I am with private behavior. But I do know this, having watched the way in which these major carriers have worked, I become more and more distressed at the way in which they behave. And so at the very least, I'm willing to mount a strong verbal attack on these kinds of policies I tried to do in the hope that there'll be some degree of liberalization. I'm also very much in favor of incurring new entries into all of these spaces uh, so that you don't have to get all your information from a company like Google. You could go to DuckDuckGo or some other carrier which is going to provide you with other terms. Uh, I think the real sad lesson that you learn from this is that in the world of second best, it's extremely difficult to figure out which of these second best solutions is the better second best solution. And so what you do is you keep talking and harping on these kinds of issues, but find it extremely difficult to regulate. There are some analogies like lending libraries and railroads that get you a part of the way uh, but one of the things that we've discovered is every new generation of technology introduces a set of challenges that you did not have in the previous way, which requires you to some extent to rethink your property rights. Common carriers and railroads required some form of the Interstate Commerce Commission, uh, which experimented with design after design from 1886 for a uh, hundred years thereafter. When you had airplanes, all of a sudden, uh, the old rule that you owned to the top of the sky had to be displaced by some other rule. You had to have new property rights. The same is true with respect to oil and gas and water law. If you study property, what you understand is that the variety of institutions and practices that you have is so numerous uh, that it's extremely difficult under these circumstances to have one uniform set of world. So I share with you uh, your sense of genuine uneasiness I have yet to see what I would regard as a powerful, coherent statement 
which points me clearly in one direction. I don't mean to say that there aren't powerful arguments or considerations or that there are certain things that I think go way over the top. I'm saying that a first best solution is extremely difficult uh, to realize. Done. Molly? Alrighty. Next up, we have Trevor Kay. Hi, Professor Epstein. Uh, my name is Trevor Kerr, and I was one of your uh, students in Roman law at the University of Chicago. Ah, um, along I'm with Jordan Hill. <laughs> um, I'm currently clerking for Judge Kobus on the Eighth Circuit. Good for um, you. My question for you is this. So you've described your arc from being a natural rights sort of person to being more of a libertarian utilitarian. Mm -hmm. And I recall once in Roman law, you asked one of my colleagues why John Locke was a Marxist. Um, why exactly is the, the, the rationale behind natural rights and natural law not convincing to you? Well, you ask very large questions because they are and they aren't. But let's start out with the, the John Locke question, okay? Um, one of the things that we discovered when we looked at John is that he did not know his Roman law. And so if you recall, we spent a lot of time in Roman law talking about two passages, one was Gaius 266, and the other was Justinian, Title II, uh, Book 1, Paragraph 12, both of which says that the way in which you acquire property is through occupation, which is not the same thing as a labor theory of value. What occupation means that with respect to things that are amenable to it, uh, the class includes land, chattels, and wild animals. There's a rule of occupation or capture, and the object under the system is to spend as little energy as possible to demarcate your thing from the rest of the world uh, so that you preserve the surplus associated with its ownership. And then you increase the value of the things that you own by having rights of development, rights of use, rights of alienation and trade, which allow you either to sell the thing, to mortgage a thing, to pool the thing with partnerships or something else. And that particular consensus was the one which David Hume absolved when he started to talk about the same issues as a very young man in his treatise of human nature. When Locke starts to say that the way in which you acquire property is to mix your labor with a particular thing, and it's that which gets to you, he's doing exactly the opposite. Now he's saying uh, the only way that you could get property is to mix your labor with something. Uh, the more you get depends on the more that you have to spend. That's a Marxist type theory, which says that the value that you get in goods is a function of the labor that you put into it. It's absolutely crazy as an analytical matter. Uh, you can drill oil with a spoon and it will cost you an enormous amount, but it's just not worth doing. And the theory is not that inputs determine the value of the output, but the output is determined by market forces. And then the person who has the inputs will decide whether or not it's prudent to invest in those particular things or it's not. And so what happens is the left Marxists uh, or the left Lockians have a very powerful case to say that the labor theory of value puts you in that direction. Now, when you start dealing with occupati or in the correct rule, it becomes perfectly clear that you always have a cost to the system, namely that some people are excluded from a particular good. Um, and so Proudhon and similar types, anarchists said, you can't enclose land for farming because previously I was allowed to wander over that land in order to hunt. And there has to be an answer to that question, but it's a little bit more complicated than as simple I want it. Essentially, as we noted, when you create private property, you can now invest in clearing the soil. So the value to you goes up as it goes up to your trading partners. Other people can start to do the same thing. And so as you start to do this, uh, the exchange economy is much more valuable than the open economy. And then property rights turn out to have a, a not necessarily fixed nature. Uh, so you can easily create systems, as was common in the case, uh, that if I have land that is arable but not cultivated, other individuals in accordance with custom could go back and forth across my land to hunt, but they cannot essentially take away some mine stuff from, from the land, cop down trees, sit there and build a house and so forth. And so what you do is you develop a very complicated system of a division of rights. The central challenge in Roman law and in modern law starts with the creation of a single unitary thing. And then what you try to do is to figure out how you can fragment it uh, to get greater value out of the same issue through either voluntary or through involuntary transaction. And what Locke did is not understand the sort of dynamic of a private system, use the labor theory of value, which is appropriate in some circumstances having to do with liens and the like, but not in this particular case for occupatio. And so 
This is it. So now is this, to answer your last question, is this a form of natural law or utilitarian? And what happens is if you go back and try to understand the origin of natural law theory, you discover a very interesting thing when you compare Blackstone um, with Bentham. One was supposed to be a natural lawyer and the other a utilitarian. They used exactly the same argument. Essentially what happens is early versions of natural law, they were intuitive utilitarians. They managed to say these things were true, not because of their efficiency properties of which they had very little systematic understanding, but they used other tests. They said, well, this seems to be reasonable. People seem to flourish as a group. We find these things pretty widespread across cultures at any given time. We find that they endure in a single culture over a long period of time. So even though we don't have a theory of competition coming out of property rights until the late 19th or early 20th century, what we do is we have experiential knowledge that points in the same direction. And so it's extremely important when you do this work to constantly ask the question, whether or not customary evolution on the one hand, which is a bottoms up approach and the academic approach starting from the top going down, do they converge in some place in the middle? And I think that if you stick to the natural or utilitarian tradition as opposed to the Marxist tradition, the two things rather than opposing themselves, which is the modern view, turn out to be hardly complementary. Okay, next question. All right, next up we have Isaiah McKinney. Hi, Isaiah. I don't have Isaiah. Isaiah, you're not muted. You're not unmuted. I still see that ugly red microphone with a slash through it. Professor Epstein, can you hear me? You're a free man. Yes. Yeah. Where's the mic? Are you going to sing? Professor Epstein, can you hear me? Yep, yeah, perfectly. Sorry about that. Thank you. So you mentioned about how the civil rights acts have potentially created a culture in which, and at least we've taken it to the point today where diversity can undermine the productivity, productivity of the labor markets. And it doesn't take into account the different types of needs in a labor market where diversity could actually, or forced diversity could actually be an issue. Mm -hmm. Is that a product is the, today's current culture a product of the civil rights the acts themselves such that ideally we, would, we wouldn't have them? Or is, is it just a misconception of our understanding of diversity? I guess so my question is specifically, is the solution to move to a situation where we're not requiring any sort of anti-discrimination or do we still need anti-discrimination and just need to change the way we enforce it? Okay, look, I think you really have to go back uh, to the situation that existed prior to 1964 to understand the perfectly powerful justifications and motivations for the adoption of a, a Civil Rights Act in 1964. Uh, anybody who thought that labor markets in the South and to some extent in the North were open and competitive markets simply did not look at the ways in which these things operate. One of the things that happens in a competitive market if there's a group that is systematically underserved, somebody will come in by way of new entry in order to satisfy that. And nobody could persuade to me credibly that there were no white persons in the South uh, before 1964 who were willing, even eager to work with blacks or the other way around. And yet everywhere you look, you start to see only segregated businesses. And so the first thing that you start to think about is not market failure, because markets don't operate that way, leaving systematic long-term occupy opportunities unsatisfied, you start to think of what the kind of regulation is that keeps it going. Uh, this was exactly the question that was asked by um, C. Van Woodrin in his book, The Strange Career of Jim Crow, written towards the end of the segregation period. He says, I don't understand how this stuff manages to persist with clear and overt segregation when there are no formal rules on the books uh, that explain it. And I thought about that for a long time. And then it goes right back to the common carrier issue that I thought about is probably given the best um, theoretical answer, it would be nice to have empirical verification of it, which is uh, the way in which you keep people in line is not by pounding them over the head publicly, it's by saying, unless you segregate your business, you're not gonna get your water, you're not gonna get your electricity, you're not gonna get your power. Oh, you may get them, but we may cut them off from time to time. And it turns out you could do this covertly, 
you can do it highly effectively because you've got monopoly power and other people will start to play online. My guess is that's the mechanism that started to be used and it was supplemented by private violence against any other individuals who wanted to engage in integrative activities. And the police often turned a blind eye to that. Uh, this managed to persist itself because if you look at the voting rules, it turns out that the level of black registration in the South was minuscule in this particular period. So the public officials were responsive to the people who elected them and not to the population at, at large. So what you did is you have a perfect failure of government behavior. The federal government comes in and how is it supposed to basically influence this situation? Uh, it can't take over the state governments. And so what it tries to do is to essentially say, uh, we're going to have to have a colorblind policy with respect to labor and employment. And that was passed in 1964. There were a lot of compromises about how that was to be implemented for unions. Uh, but one of the key things about the early enforcement was for the most part, it was not with respect to the private sector. It was directed to government offices, which had different pay scales for black teachers and white teachers and so on up and down the line. Now, when it came to the private sector, what happens is uh, we basically put the colorblind norm into place uh, regarding people not to look at this at a time when it turns out that now the sentiment in the workforce is beginning to change. And there are large numbers of businesses and uh, large numbers of trades that actually think that some kind of an affirmative action program, uh, at least as a transitional matter, would work. That could be done in a very decentralized fashion. But until the Weber decision, which was adopted in 1979, essentially anybody who wanted to engage in a private um, affirmative action program was in violation of the explicit colorblind principle that we had in the statute. And in fact, uh, uh, this was kind of ironic uh, because this thing was passed in 1964. Uh, then the riots start to hit, at which point I can remember this as a, basically a college graduate at this time, a huge sentiment saying that we really have to do something and we cannot follow the old view, which is to wait till the education system does its work so that by 1986, we'll have a fair labor force. And people wanted to do this and they constantly got stymied. And that was in fact a real tragedy. One of the things that happens with the civil rights law is you lock yourself into a given position. And then when you lock yourself into a given position, you find that it doesn't work. Well, at that particular point, I'm not attacking the motivations of the statute, uh, Hubert Humphrey in those days was one of my heroes, the man of great courage. He was the guy who stood up to the Southern segregationists in Philadelphia in 1948 um, and led to the breakup of the Dixiecrat Party. I mean, this man was all good in terms of his motivation, uh, but I don't think he understood what happened. So then what you have to do, since you can't repeal the statute, you have to flip it around a bit. And the original situation was as follows. Uh, first, with respect to disparate treatment, there's a case called McConnell against Green, McDonnell Douglas against Green, excuse me. And what it started to do is to tell you how you make out a dis, uh, disparate treatment case of intentional discrimination. But the way they put it, uh, only minority groups could get the benefit of that test. It wasn't even argued, it was just stated as a three-part test. You show you're a member of a group, you show that you're passed over. Uh, they try to show that there has been some kind of a qualification. And if they keep advertising the job when you are qualified after you were passed over, you have a presumptive case. Uh, then in 1971, just a couple of years before, you start having disparate impact cases, uh, which were a complete misreading of the statute by uh, Chief Justice Berger in an effort to try and goose these things up. And so what happens is essentially you get a twofold tale. On the one hand, any form of discrimination in favor of minority groups is going to be blessed. Any form of discrimination against them is going to be denounced. Uh, to some extent, this is a stable situation. Uh, because there were very few firms, certainly as the years went on, that wanted to run active discrimination programs against minority workers. And there were a large number that wanted to do it. So I always describe the blessing of affirmative action that started with um, uh, the situation in Weber and then carries through in education to other cases. I treat that as essentially a partial repeal of the Civil Rights Act, which gave firms and government agencies greater freedom to act as they want. And so oddly enough, although it looks a little bit asymmetrical and it's not as good as getting rid of the statute in its entirety, it doesn't have any symbolic blowback and it achieved a great deal of what's happened. What's happened after this, however, is that now we don't believe in the old version of a disparate impact group. Uh, where in the Duke Power, you had to show that there was a pool of qualified workers. And then out of that pool, what you did is you took too many people from one group relative to people in another group. That was the way in which you started to align this, uh, but you had to do it. So 
You didn't do it for the population at whole. When you start looking at the current claims about systematic racism or about discrimination and disparate impact, nobody wants to make those kinds of corrections. And so at this point, you have to confront the very powerful reality in the United States, which is ask yourself how many members of this, that, or the other minority group get PhDs in mathematics, how many of them are trained for programmers and so forth. And you discover that there are all sorts of differences that are not easy to get rid of. I'm very much in favor of trying to remedy these problems by mainly the use of charter schools on the one hand and vouchers on the other hand to break what I think to be a very dangerous situation, namely public school monopolies, uh, which wield inordinate influences. You could see in the COVID period how they managed to shut down too much of public education uh, for the convenience of teachers, not for the students. I'm in favor of all that. There's a lot of resistance to it. And even if you did it, it's not exactly clear as to how much good it would do even in the long or the short run. But I think what you really want to do is that. You also want to have private groups. If they want to give specialized aid to one class of people or another class of people, by all means, they should be allowed to do so and not be subject to anti-discrimination norm. Freeing up markets is the best way in which you could start to achieve these kinds of results. And what happens is the modern Civil Rights Act goes in the opposite direction. So the last person who is quoted these days is Martin Luther King. If you look at the university level, it turns out you have to swear allegiance to their version of monochromatic diversity in order to even be considered for appointments. And I think that's going way too far on this situation. I still believe in old fashioned views with respect to merit, subject to the following qualification, at least in private institutions, if they want to put a leg up here or a leg up there, it's fine. When you get the public institution, it turns out you get the following very serious difficulty that it's difficult to overcome. Namely, you find the situation is that private institutions can stop at the margin because they make trade-offs, at least if they're not coerced by government, whereas public institutions tend to go all one way or the other. So it was not a complete surprise that outgunned, outmanned, and outspent uh, that the opponents of getting rid of the ban on affirmative action in California education, Proposition 16, or whatever it was called, uh, they managed to win when they were outspent 20 to 1. And I think that's because people understand uh, that state situations are dangerous. And I would want to stress things that could be done well in private competitive markets, whether motivated by the profit motive, as education often is not, or by something else, are fine. But the moment you get state monopolies in there, uh, you cannot essentially keep the gyroscope moving on its appropriate fashion. So what you're seeing today is not anything that was mandated in 1964. If you go back and you look at Hubert Humphrey, he kept on describing this as a mild and moderate act. It may not have been quite that, uh, but it was a very different beast than the civil rights movement uh, that we're facing today. And I think the more recent changes are ones that I generally disapprove of. Thank you. Still going. Indeed. All right, next up we have Dolores G. Hello, Dolores. I don't see. Ah, yes. Hello, Dolores. You, you got to unmute yourself, my dear. Dolores. Unmute. That red microphone with the bar through it is stunning. She's She basically hasn't given up. We should come back to her when she figures out how to get it off because um, I see no movement. I that don't see. Good. All right, how about we'll try to come back to Dolores, but what if we go to Todd Pettis right now? Todd, you're on, but please. Okay. Professor, I see. Professor Epstein, how are you? Well, I'm fine, and, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much for spending your time, and thanks to the organizers for doing this. Uh, I appreciate your setting things up tonight about the choice between uh, classical view and the progressive view. And I wonder if you just use uh, COVID as a kind of a case study to respond to something. I'm wondering... Uh, to what degree you think the, the gravity and the urgency of a problem bears upon the societal choice between those two models at a given point in time. And you took some heat early in 2020 for, uh, you know, low predictions about uh, death rates. I just wonder if, you know, if would your, and people use that then as an opportunity to discount anything else you were going to say on the subject. Well, I wonder if you could. Yeah, and if you knew at the time, would your governmental prescriptions be the same or is it, or does the urgency or if we, if we had that benefit of foresight, does that weigh on our choice about how much we the government should get involved? In well, you're asking exactly the right question. I'm going to begin with a Roman maxim as usual. 
uh, which is that necessity is something that ordinarily suspends property rights. Um, and that is a perfectly appropriate way to think about these situations. It starts with the simple case where somebody owns a piece of land, somebody is desperate to get out of the cold and they block them from coming in. Uh, you can basically attack the person who's trying to keep you out to defend your right to survive. If on the other hand, you break into the house, uh, you're allowed to do so, it's not a trespass, you might have to pay compensation. And so this is not a question. The issue is then how do you make these kinds of predictions for what's going on? So uh, to put the point there, I looked at these numbers back in March of, uh, of uh, March 16th, I think it was. And uh, there was a standard model that was put out and I was 100% convinced that it was 100% wrong. Um, not that I didn't make my own mistakes, but let's explain what the model was, why I thought it was wrong and why that particular conclusion turned out. Uh, in order to understand the way in which these sort of epidemiological situations work, think of the world as having two stages, uh, one of which is a quiet phase and one which is a visible phase. And what happens in the quiet phase is that nobody is aware that there's actually a germ type attack that's taking place. And what they do is they continue to pack together in the way they've always done. When we talk about herds, don't think about this as herd immunity in the first instance. Herds by nature always come very close to one another in order to protect themselves against large predators, right? So you'll watch a, a herd in the desert taking care of a wildebeest against the lions and so forth. Uh, when you try to protect yourself against big enemies, you expose yourself to these very tiny little enemies. You're brushing against one another. If one of them gets infected, the others are ignorant. It just spreads through the herd. In some cases, it will wipe the whole herd out. In some cases, there may be some animals which have disproportionate immunity, and if they are attacked by a virus which is relatively weaker than the common situation, they may well be able to survive. What happened is by the time we got to March 16, and you were in New York City, uh, there was probably a fairly extensive spread of the virus, mainly by people packed into subways and innocent of everything that had gone on. And we were not aware of it at that particular time. Uh, but what was very clear is if you looked at the charts that were being put forward, uh, mainly by Nick Kristoff in the New York Times, what they had was a chart which began with virtually nothing on March 16th, peaking at 10,000, no, 10 million viable cases on July 15th, and then going down to virtually nothing. So it was a very sharp peak and valley, but it was three months off into the future. That could not happen. Uh, the reason it could not happen is the moment you put the chart on there, everybody is going to be aware of what's going on. So even before the lockdown began on March 10th, what happened is you saw radical declines in the number of people who went to restaurants, or the number of people who flew on planes, the number who took the subways and so forth. Uh, so what that suggests is that now what you're going to see is the other half of the logistic curve where things start to go down. And this was certainly true. Uh, if you look at the great pandemic of 1918, it went up like a shot, uh, stayed level for about four or five weeks and then plummeted back down again. Uh, there were 675,000 deaths out of 100 million people and it took place within nine weeks. Uh, most of this then was a resurgence later because of a mutation, but you could see the pattern. So that had to have been wrong. And the number that they gave, given the adaptive responses, had to be wrong as well. You are not going to be able to get this number up to one or two million dead people under these circumstances, given the kinds of behaviors that happen, wholly apart from vaccines, medications, and everything else. Uh, my mistake was I looked at the Korean situation, saw what the number was, and figured that that might turn out to be the numbers here. So I had this ridiculous 500 number, uh, which, by the way, was fully recanted. Um, as of April 6th, and indeed in a rather disastrous interview with the New Yorker magazine, uh, they were not particularly nice about it um, in late March. I mean, I also made it very clear, uh, but the argument that I made against the dominant model was correct. Now, why does this matter? Because what happened is there were several catastrophic responses that were made in the city in response to the very fearsome models that we saw both from uh, the New York Times and from the Imperial College model uh, with Neil Ferguson. Uh, that is, you assume it's going to be that deadly, you start to shut everything down. And that's exactly what they did in New York City. And they shut down too many things, including hospitals. They weren't clear what the pattern was with respect to the spread of these particular viruses. So they hit safe and not so safe institutions at the same time. That means that people weren't getting other kinds of medical care. They were losing their jobs, higher risk of suicide, all the other stuff that takes place. And then 
On March 25th, there was another colossal blunder by a Governor Cuomo, who using the anti-discrimination laws, basically said that uh, nursing homes were required to take COVID positive patients back into their ranks, even though that was the most dangerous area for these things to spread. That was done in multiple states. It probably cost about, you know, five, 10, 15, 20,000. We don't have the exact numbers, but it's a very large number that started to happen. Why was that? Because they wanted to clear out beds for what they would thought was a much larger epidemic than the one that took place. And they were wrong with respect to the estimate. If they had tried to do the more standard logistic curve, they would have realized that those numbers would have been lower. In fact, the peak probably took place before the second wave in early April. Uh, the, if you look at the graphs, those graphs are wrong in the sense that what happens is they put the uh, entries on the graph as of the date the cases are reported, not the case of what they occurred. So you see some funny spikes going out into Maine, into May. Most of those, in fact, belong earlier on. Uh, so what you do is you get yourself into a fairly peak situation with a downward curve. Uh, then what happens is how do you treat it thereafter it becomes very critical. Uh, we have adopted a strategy which is not designed to allow for the creation of herd immunity. We've done one which is essentially designed to isolate until we can get a vaccine or the thing somehow or other blows over. I'm not sure that this is correct. And, and the problem here has to do with the question of how you treat asymptomatic cases. Uh, the standard wisdom on this is that asymptomatic traces, um, hello, are you, are you still there? Um, asymptomatic cases, uh, yes, you are there. Asymptomatic cases are things to be worried about. Uh, but in fact, one of the things you must understand about the virus is that the way in which it operates is not uniform. Uh, people have different susceptibilities to it. These susceptibilities actually can modify even during the life of a single person, depending upon the stimuluses that you get. That's why, for example, when Jenner discovered that cowpox was a vaccine that worked for smokepox, he adopted a strategy that is sometimes used today. You give a weak version of the a virus, it then stimulates the antibody response so that when the strong version comes along, uh, you're able to resist it. That's exactly the kind of smart way in which to start thinking about these things. Uh, but it turns out there are some people um, who are what they call super spreaders, meaning in effect that they get the thing, they don't suffer from it, because what they do is they have a very powerful immune system and they could survive what are lethal doses for other individuals. So if you look around, it turns out they're supposed to be 2% of the population are super spreaders, and they can spread havoc around because they are quite dangerous. But 98% of the people may not be super spreaders, and they may, in effect, be like the cowpox and help people kind of get through it. So what we've done is we've adopted a strong strategy where we to keep the super spreaders out, we keep out the other people. So we have a population with 15 million people who are infected. Uh, but the rest of the population is very uncertainty as to how many of them have the antibody. And why is this an important issue? If you go back and you look at the situation in 1918, what you discover is that uh, the virus was truly deadly, much more deadly than this one. There were no complications with respect to comorbidities, which probably reduced the effective death rate by 60, maybe even 80%. Uh, what happened is you killed people in the prime of life, you killed people when they were little kids, and you killed some people over 65, which was in 1918 a much smaller fraction of the population than we start to have today. So why do people between 25 and 35 desire this stuff? Well, it's because of what they call the cytokine storm. Uh, what happens is your immune system is so powerful, uh, you see this thing come in there and you rev it into high gear, and essentially what happens is your lungs get flooded by fluid, and you did not die of pneumonia or some other kinds of differences. So if you look at the statistics from the New York City Health Authority on this stuff, you'll see a very high peak. And the very high peak goes up not only for the virus, but also for pneumonia. If you look at the current situation where the cytokine reaction is relatively unimportant, the number of pneumonia cases that are involved is very, very much lower. It's a completely different distribution, a very different kind of virus. And so what we've done in effect is now we've decided to prolong it. Is this the correct strategy? Well, you can debate this till the sun comes down. Here's the argument. If you look at 1918, there probably was a very large amount of asymptomatic transactions because the known case of people who got flu resulting in conversion was 2.5% relative to about 0.1% today, uh, which means that in a population of about um, 100 million, you have 22 million or so people getting it, that's below herd immunity.
There may well have been, we don't know, uh, some kind of asymptomatic transfer uh, that started to decline, explain the decline. We don't have these here. Uh, so what happens is you go through the summer, uh, basically the heat is a retarding agent from what's going on. Being outside is a retarding agent from going outside. When you get to the winter, all of a sudden this stuff regroups and you have to try to figure out how you can solve this problem. I think in effect, the two best solutions are in the short run, HCQ and lots of fresh air uh, to clear the lungs out and so forth. Uh, other people think it's mask or something else. Um, it's pretty clear that what's ever being tried now is not working particularly well. And one of the great challenges for everybody, myself included, is to give an explanation as to why the rise has been this way. We do know that the number of cases is much higher than it was in April. We also know that the number of deaths is somewhat higher now than it was in April, but not proportionate. There's some evidence that the viral load is reduced, which is an evolutionary response, but it's not conclusive. There's some evidence that treatment is better. Uh, but that's not conclusive. <laughs> so what you're doing is you're left with a lot of kind of information. My own view is to prefer the strategy which says isolate those at maximum risk and try to let the rest of the economy run forward. And that's not the majority position. I've taken strong stands against what Mr. Fauci has done on many of these issues. I continue to do so. I'm not trying to defend my own past mistakes. I mean, I think when you make a mistake, you kind of open up and I said this was the largest unforced error I've made in my academic career. People seem to remember the mistakes. They don't remember the correction. Uh, they also forget the situation that I was tacking on was every bit as wrong as anything that I said at the time. And I haven't heard anybody who put forward those particular models come back and say, gee, um, why is it that the model said that the peak was gonna be 10 million cases in, it turns out, July of 2020, when it turned out to be 60,000 cases in early April of the same year. Those are not the same model. I was closer in terms of my prediction to the actual results than the other model. Um, I don't apologize for this. I'm a lawyer, as I said, uh, but I've studied evolutionary theory. I've taught the stuff about the FDA. I know something about game theory and so forth. One of the things that lawyers are is they're kind of generalists. And they always, in my case, wade into fields where they're not full-time experts, but that's why I began in the way I did. I think outsiders have an enormous amount to contribute uh, by challenging insiders. And I think that the current culture, which says, oh, if you make one mistake, you should be forever silent, is wrong. If you read all the other papers that I've written on the COVID situation, I think they hold up pretty well. So I'm happy to take another question. Wonderful. All right, next we have John C. John, I, I'll get that microphone off. Good, John. All right, Professor, can you hear me? I hear you loud and clear, sir. All right, Professor. So uh, just as background, I am no longer a lawyer. I, I changed up and now I am a director of investment strategy at a family of private equity and infrastructure funds. So uh, expect a bit of a finance-based question on this one, but oh, you're in great. New York, I'm so I expect you're going to enjoy it. Um, so I was very interested earlier in your quote from Adam Smith, but I want to throw a uh, Schumpeter at you, right? Uh, the, the classic line of creative destruction um, is answered as to why it's so important a few lines down from its original um, introduction in which Schumpeter says that uh, we need creative destruction because without this, um, it will give the enemies of capitalism the opportunity to fundamentally undermine it. Uh, this ultimately relates to its importance within the business cycle. And I would hope to get your thoughts on uh, the way the, the Federal Reserve is somewhat extending out business cycles artificially, somewhat reinterpretation, I guess you could argue, of the, of the Federal Reserve Act earlier this year, uh, as well as the potential danger of this leading to uh, the revival of a rather failed economic uh, German school of thought that's more colloquially known as today as MMT. Oh, who? MMT? Can you explain what the initials stand for before I decide to agree? Oh, modern monetary theory? Oh, modern monetary theory? Okay, look, let me start off with the, the Fed. And, and as usual, I think there is a fatal miscalculation in its basic design. If you look at the standard policy, we're supposed to deal with monetary policy on the one hand, by which I mean either a stable currency in terms of a volume of currency out there or a stable rate of interest, whatever you want to make stable, and jobs. My view is you cannot do two things with one tool. Uh, if you need to expand the money supply to help with jobs and you need to contract it to deal with inflation, uh, you're going to pick some number in between, which is likely to do none. 
And so I'm basically a man who believes that one tool should serve one purpose, not multiple purposes. And the moment you start to have these sort of factorial situations put into place, what you're doing is just asking for trouble. So I am not a believer in the current situation. So let's concentrate on which field. Well, labor is better handled by looking at labor law. And so you want the monetary theory and the fiscal policy to deal with aggregates and you want contracts at will, anti-union legislation, minimum wage law, or whatever it is that you think to handle the labor sector. So what then is the next thing? Well, I think what happens is uh, the great problem that you have with respect to this is the one that you've talked about, which is do we find that the Fed is a neutral party which is designed to maintain stability or is it going to become an institution which is engaged in various kinds of selective and discretionary activities, i.e. making bailouts for one company but not for another. And so we have the whole problem with respect to the way in which we want to treat the AIG bailout uh, or what goes on in that particular case as opposed to the Fannie and Freddie bailout. Uh, AIG was a more successful operation uh, because what happened is the federal government did not displace the private trustees as they did with respect to Fannie and Freddie. So there was some degree of a negotiation. On the other hand, the lending authority that the Fed had said you were not supposed to be able to take back an equity interest, which is a terrible way to try to run lending and rescue operations. And so at the last moment, they invented this third party transfer system, which really didn't work uh, to give uh, the shares to a company that was wholly owned by the Fed, uh, which essentially had the equity position. And, you know, it kind of survived. And, you know, the guys retained a stub interest in this. And it turned out that when the thing got reinflated, uh, the company was actually revived. Fannie and Freddie did not do that at all. Uh, but we decide to save AIG, we decide not to save Lehman Brothers and so forth. So a lot of the problems that you're talking about sort of come in this direction. And the moment we decide that we're going to use the Fed to achieve other kinds of goals other than monetary stability, I think what happens is its independence becomes compromised and its effectiveness becomes compromised. Now, the Schumpeter position, I don't think is necessarily lined up perfectly with the question of uh, financial stability. I think it's more lined up with the question of, of innovation with respect to capitalism system. Now, what do we mean by creative discussion? I want to make it as operational as possible. You have a company which has a dominant position by making widgets in a given kind of market. The widget is now seven years old. And what you keep on doing is making marginal improvements in the widget. So by the time you're seven years out, it's 25% better than it was at the time that you started. Uh, that's not the same thing as discontinuous behavior. And, and so what you're always going to be worried about is you're making these marginal improvements in the way in which you run a propeller plane and somebody comes along with a jet and they're going to wipe you out because they are quieter, they are faster, they are cheaper in their operation. You know that this is coming. You could do one of two things. Uh, you can say, hey, they're going to wipe me out, sign or and goodbye. Or you can say, I'm going to cannibalize my own successful business basically put it into the tubes so that I can survive the fight in another generation. And so therefore, what you try to do if you're a good business is to junk your original business plan and put your wealth. So the creative destruction that you're having in that case is a firm that's eating its own young quite uh, clearly in order to be able to survive with respect to the next generation. Oftentimes, existing leadership is very reluctant to do that. Sometimes it takes control of a board of directors of a company to find a new CEO, to transform the situation from what it is. And you start to see the way in which people come and take over IBM and they convert it from a mainframe company into a service company. Or Microsoft is now a company that specializes more in the cloud than it does with respect to its various kinds of uh, internet service and things of that sort. Uh, that is essentially the way in which these companies have to work. And of course, uh, it's not necessarily that if you eat your own, uh, you're going to succeed. But the point is, at least you're in the fight. Other people will start to come in. And the basic challenge that you want to have in those cases is not to give any particular necessary advantage uh, to a legacy holder in these businesses. So if the new guy turns out to sell things a little bit better than the old guy, you don't want barriers to entry to apply to new entrants that don't apply with respect to existing firms starting to go into another type of situation. Now, the other thing that Schumpeter said, uh, which was kind of associated with this stuff with respect to creative destruction, is he said, you know, look, uh, given that these firms are so large and so impersonal in terms of the way it's going, capitalism is going to fail. 
uh, because the capitalists, at least those who are not the mega capitalists, will not have a sufficient investment in their own businesses that they're willing to fight for the firm. And I think that's a colossally wrong kind of prediction that what happens is uh, we are aware of this problem. And so when you're running a firm, <laughs> the first thing that your personnel office has to do is to find a decent way in which to incentivize your various workers so that what they can do is essentially realize that they're going to advance as the company advances. <clears throat> and this requires incredibly complicated compensation options in which wages are one feature, but deferred benefits, options, stocks, perps, pensions, whatever it is you're talking about are part of these things in an effort to try to realign the assumptions. And there is a, an elaborate theory starting with Jensen and Meckling in 1976 on agency theory, uh, which says, you know, every time you get an agent, there's a conflict of interest with the principal. They both want to go in the same direction, but they want to go at different rates of speed. And that the essential task is to figure out how much you can spend to monitor these relationships so as to minimize the sum of three costs, uh, the loss to the employer, the loss to the worker, and the overall residual loss to the kind of business, knowing you're never going to be able to get many people to work together as one. But once you're armed about this thing and you understand that theory, uh, then you could start to take steps. And it's not a mistake if you uh, look at the Social Science Network, which is run by Jensen, actually one of the, the most cited article in that particular uh, thing turns out to be that particular article. Why is this? Because as creative discussion exists with innovation in firms, uh, the question of conflicts of interest exists with firms in stable industries, expanding firms, contracting firms. Uh, all you need to do to have a conflict of interest is to have an employer and an employee, and then you have to figure out how it is you're going to manage it. Sometimes you could do it with a personal chops. Sometimes not. I think there's time for one short question, Molly, but I hope I'm still standing. If not, I'm getting very tired. No, you sure are. We will head to our last question from a special guest, Mr. Eugene Meyer. Mr. Meyer, nemesis for 30 years. How, how are you? And, and well, thank I'm, I'm, I'm holding up just fine. Thank you. I'm, we're losing some of our audience, but uh, I hope this thing will be broadcast worldwide. Well, I think you've done a, a, a wonderful job. I, I, I thought I'd try to throw you with my last question a little bit by going into a different, somewhat different area. <clears throat> How much was some of the problems that we, we, we face in terms of, you know, trying to do things sort of rationally, what is the effect of the, law, of the significant reduction of religion in society and the corresponding reduction of, of um, maybe certain types of accepted morality that we perhaps had somewhat more of in other periods of time. And how does, and does that, does that affect things economically, both in terms of honesty and, uh, and, and accepted honesty and in other ways? Look, I mean, this is a very important issue. And, and one of the ways in which you could start to think about this is to say that religion has two aspects. One about the relationship that an individual has with his or her version of what the divine is. And the other is it's a series of personal attributes which actually make it easier for you to cooperate with other individuals. Uh, one of my favorite expressions, one of George Schultz's favorite expressions, is that trust is the coin of the realm. And what you mean by that is if you have somebody whom you can trust, then you can deal with them and leave yourself exposed knowing that they will not take advantage of you so that you could have deals move at a more rapid rate, have larger amounts of exchange, lower transactions costs. What religion serves as in many of these cases, if it's the right religion, I it's not a religion that believes in mass slaughter, is that what it does essentially under these circumstances is it's a signal of trust. So you have somebody who's religious in a certain way. Um, they are known to keep their promises. Other people will start to deal with them. It may well be that the only people who are affected by this are co-religionists. It may well be that this is a binding mechanism that works with respect to the world. Uh, but what happens is if you can develop this, it's fine. Now, you mentioned this about morality. One of the things that you get when you start teaching Roman law is the following observation, which is the set of legal institutions on primary behavior are remarkably constant over time and across cultures. Uh, but these are always legal relationships which tend to have hard edges. The contract at will, a Roman as well as a modern device, means I can fire you, Eugene, for good reason, bad reason, or no reason at all, as I mentioned to you before. Uh, but if you have a system of trust or a system of informal norms, it turns out people are willing to live with that kind of situation 
because they're protected by the soft norms of which religion turns out to be one of these kinds of organizations. So uh, what happens is uh, if you get rid of the religion type situation, you have to find another source of bonding in order to take its place. And it's kind of difficult to do so if you're simply looking at people and saying, well, you just ought to trust one another. Some people can do it. They join the Boy Scouts, which of course has a big religious orientation. Other people may not. The other thing I think why religion turns out to be important is that in a world like ours, uh, redistribution by coercion turns out not to be a winning proposition in private law. And so one of the things you like to say is, as and for my first cause of action, I'm going to sue you for a want of benevolence, i.e. you did not give me what I need. Um, and the question is, who am I supposed to sue when anybody could provide it to me? It turns out the effort to create positive rights in the world of benevolence is a completely broken situation and nobody attempts it. If you're gonna do it at all, you're gonna to have to do it through state power, uh, which has serious runs because anytime you have public redistribution, it can be commandeered by people who have rather private institutions. So it's a vulnerable situation. And so what religion does along with other kinds of moralities is that it says, we really believe that these are not random choices. They are what the classical liberals call imperfect obligations, meaning there's a matter of social convention and it's a matter of conscience. Uh, if you are more fortunate than other individuals, you are under some kind of a duty to help out of your particular wealth individuals who are greater in need. Many people say, oh, this is just a joke, but it's not a joke. If you go back and you look at the great 19th century organizations, one of the things you should do is always ask yourself, who is the person behind the various institutions? So I say, oh, there's the Sloan Kettering Medical Center. Well, who was Sloan and who were Kettering, right? Well, uh, people may not remember today, but Sloan was a very progressive and enlightened head of General Motors. He put together the five car Wendell, uh, Cadillac, Buick, Oldsmobile, um, uh, Pontiac and Chevrolet. I mean, it was great achievement. He did all that stuff. And Charlie Kettering supplied him with batteries and other stuff. They took their fortune. And what did they do? They turned it to a hospital, which is still a, a world leader in the treatment of cancer and similar kinds of diseases. Who is Johns Hopkins? Who is Leland Stanford Jr.? Who is Mr. Barnard? Who is Mr. Harvard? Who is Mr. Yale? These are all people. And they're all people who essentially had either religious or similar motivations to form these kinds of organizations. And if you don't have this kind of religious situation, then the issue is where are you going to get the volunteerism from? The progressive give no answer to that because they're always in favor of coercive transfers. And one of the things that we know is the more coercive transfers you have, uh, the less money there's available for voluntary transfers. So it often is a substitution of inefficient public giving for more efficient private giving by people who can pick their beneficiaries, know how to monitor, know how to hire people in order to run those particular situations. I'm not saying it's impossible uh, without a religious conviction to do it. I mean, you look at somebody like Bill Gates and his foundation, you know, they spending billions of dollars trying to deal with COVID and other situations. Now, I'm not going to look them and say, oh, my God, you don't agree with me on how these monies are supposed to be distributed. Um, my view about it is that's their business. I hope they target populations. If I agree with them, I will support them, join with them, cooperate with them. If I don't, then I'll work with some other kind of charity. So I do think that the decline of religion does have these two costs. I don't think it's necessarily fatal. I think other institutions may be able to spring up. Uh, but if you actually look at the percentage of voluntary transactions and gifts that come from religious people as opposed to non-religious people, it's still a pretty potent force in the United States. And, you know, this is a question of how it works socially. Uh, do you believe in the various kinds of theories and dogmas? I don't want to ask people that particular question. Um, I don't want anybody to ask me that particular question. Um, there's a certain issue in which I want to think about our friend, and I will end on this note, Holly, a famous quote from the Tractatus in Wittgenstein, which says, whereof you know not, thereof you must be silent. And that's me with respect to Eugene's private motivations. Okay, Gene. Gene, I put him to sleep. No, no, no I, I, that was a great answer and, 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 and thanks. Okay. And thanks to all of you. Uh, th thanks to you, Richard. And thanks, Molly, for moderating this. It was a, a, one, a, a, wonderful, a wonderful discussion and, uh, uh, and appreciate it. I, I should take this very brief chance to thank Richard, not only for this, but for the many, many programs he's done for federal study chapters over a long period of years and for much of the advice he's given to the Federal Society as well. So thank you, Richard.
Yeah, and it's a great pleasure to do it. Gene and I got together, I guess, as early as 1981 and 1982, right? 83, yes. Um, 83, when we did it, the first meeting of the Yale Federal Society that I could not attend um, and so forth. Now, we go back a long way. And, and I want to thank Gene because I think the most important feature about him, uh, contrary to what so many people take, is absolutely determination to make sure that the Federal Society remains a forum open to intellectual discourse and does not become another political action committee, which is one of the reasons why I'm so happy to do performances like this. And thank you again. Thanks. All right, well, thank everyone for joining us, especially the student division and Professor Epstein for making this study night festive possible. Uh, we assume that after the past hour, you wanna hear even more from Professor Epstein, in which case you should check out his newest book, The Dubious Morality of the Modern Administrative Law. It makes a great stocking stuffer and is available on Amazon. Yes, and it's actually worth reading. Yes, absolutely. Um, so this was a great way to get into the holiday season and wish all our students a wonderful winter break and everyone else a wonderful holiday season. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye, and thank you, Molly, ever so much. Thanks, Professor. Good to see you.